show that I'm a Okay, well, some of you may remember me as evil Nelly Olson, but tonight, thankfully, I am Alison Arngrim, and this is the Alison Arngrim Show, and here on the Alison Arngrim Show, we talk about things that make us feel good. The TV shows and the movies that made us feel good, and the people who made them, and people who are doing things now to make the world a better and much more interesting place. And oh! Oh, do I have one now? She's a, ret a returning guest, but wow, it's been like forever. It's been it's been four years. I'm like, wait, I've been doing the show for more than four years. Yes, apparently that happened. Ah, um, so <laughs> and, finally, and you know, I go crazy. I have somebody I know. And she wrote a book, and then she wrote a second book. Do you know how hard it is to write a second book? I'm just saying. So yes, again, we have someone who is a little house in the prairie. Yeah, yeah, okay. But indeed, she's written such an interesting book i i gave her a blurb for we had her on before and yes you know her as itty bitty teeny tiny little baby grace and and we were just laughing about people saying wait she can't write a book like who held the pen for her um and the idea that you know she was so young and the show shows not the book isn't about being baby grace on the show it's as i will read you the blurb that i said this is what i thought that's in the book that i i when she gave it to me to read as john lennon said Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Wendy Lou Lee's Red Tail Feathers offers a new way of looking at the things that happen to us when real life intrudes on our seemingly well-made plans. She explains that grief has its own trajectory. Her stories show that love, happiness, and even the concept of family clearly have theirs as well. No stranger to the hardest parts of life. She speaks from her own experience and describes her personal journey to finding her own understanding of grace. The day she woke up from brain surgery, yes, a healthcare worker told her that it seemed as if her veins were full of liquid joy. This is an excellent description of Wendy and the way in which she shares her gifts with the world. That's literally my review. That's how much I like this book. So, ladies and gentlemen, everybody, Wendy, Wendy, Lou, Lou, yay! Thank you, Allison. <laughs> So I can't believe, I cannot believe that we're doing this. You're on a second time. We've lived long enough that I've been doing the show that long <laughs> that you're on here. And you wrote a book, the, the, the little house devotional that was just so amazing. Um, because I said, and I said, when you wrote it, I said, there are so many fans of the show who are very, very religious and have said, wow, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if somebody from the show wrote a devotional, a Christian devotional, something I could read where it ties in themes and things that were in the TV show, Little House in the Prairie, with God, with the Bible, with my beliefs, with asking questions. If only, if only someone could do that. And none of us from the show were the person to do that. And then you, you did it. You did, you brought it. You said, here, here it is. I bring this to you. And you, you produced that and gave it to the world. And they did. They went bananas. They went, thank you. Finally. Yes. And it was so cool because it was a devotional, but it it wasn't the devotional each day. It told you, well, this is what you're going to do. Now, here's your Bible quote, and here's your prayer quote. Now, this is what you're going to do. It was a question. Everything, every page was a question. There were stories, some from the show, some about characters, some about people. And then there was a question. How do you deal with this in your life when it happens to you? How do you? And it made you think. And I met people from all different faiths and people of seemingly no faith and people who are extremely religious. And they all said, I'm get, this is great. I can, I can get into this. I am getting into this book. And it's, it's genius, genius, I tell you. Um, can you tell him that we're all proud of our babies on the show? I just going to say. Um, but it was really, really good. And you now actually have gone, you know, red tail feathers, taken it a step further. And this is, it's not quite a narrative autobiography. Not quite, almost. And But it covers a lot more of your life. And some of it, it's in stories, but then it all kind of wraps up at the end. So, yeah, it's kind of an autobiography. It's a stealth autobiography. Um, but it is, again, about finding grace and about getting through the hardest parts of life with joy and with grace, which, which you somehow do. Um, so, congratulations. How long has the book been out? Three days. Three days. <laughs> three, three, yes, yes. Three days. This has been out. So, how. How stressed out are you or not at this point? I'm calming down. Like <laughs> <laughs> with the book, is it like is the most is it right before the book comes out the most stressful? Is it the writing, the when it comes out, or the right before it comes out? I think it's the right before it comes out. I don't know about you, but 
I feel like the writing is so long ago that I remember. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's that anticipation of how it's, it's such a it's such a weird process. If any and out there, I know a lot of my friends have written books, but if you haven't written a book, I, I encourage people to do it. Um, but it's a very weird process, and it it doesn't never goes exactly how you think it's going to go. It's so it's always full of surprises. You start doing something, and then you go, "I didn't know this book was about that." Oh wow, this book! Did you find that where you start writing the book, and then you go, "Wow, this book is about way more than I thought it was going to be about." Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I say this book was like one big therapy session, <laughs> just working through all the kind of crap in my life. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now, you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> for It's the people who are just sort of like tuning into this going, wait, what, baby Grace? Wait, who, what? She's this great, tall, lovely woman. What happened? So on the show, you know, you had Laura and Mary and baby Carrie. Then you had baby Grace, who again, like all young children on TV, is played by twins. And you were one of a set of twins, which is always a weird experience. And I'm completely fascinated by twins. <laughs> um, and you, you were twins on the show and you were so tiny. How old were you when you were on the show with us? Eight months was our first episode. And then the, you know, the Ingalls moved away at the end of season eight and I was about four and a half. So four seasons, but unbelievable. And and obviously an extremely form of time. Now it, you would say all in all, and I've heard you talk about it and you do talk a little bit about it in here. Generally a positive experience. We tried to be nice to the children of Little House. We did. Was it generally a positive experience? Absolutely. It was, it was amazing. And I'd never had a bad moment on the show. So everything I write about just seems like it was the perfect place. And for us, it was. Yeah. And that's the thing is, is we were, we were that kind of place. There were so many children on the set that the focus tended to be very much about are, are the kids okay? Are they going to school? Did they eat? Did they sleep? It wasn't like sets where you have tons of adults and maybe one kid and they're just kind of, you know, whatever. So we did at least like make sure you were all right. And your mom was there and she's pretty cool. And I know that you've talked about telling a story about how when after the show ended and briefly, there was a brief shining moment where your mom thought that perhaps, hey, maybe they're going to like do other work, but you you tried other things in commercials and it was just, it was so not the same. It was not the same. No. Um, I don't think my mom was prepared for what like pounding the sidewalks of Hollywood was like and the long shooting and the directors and people that don't care about her kids <laughs> and was just like, ah, we did one commercial. And my mom was like, I think she basically called the agent up on the way, ho way home and said, ah, I think we're done. <laughs> and yeah, we when, were done. We went to kindergarten. So, you know, <laughs> when, when you do a shoot that's so bad that you're calling the agent on the way home going, I'm retiring. It's like, <laughs> you know, but that's the thing. It's easy in Hollywood, and I certainly talked about it, and Dolly you know, and Paul Peterson, everyone. So often, children are just they're, they're treated like props or part of the furniture, and and it's it's rough, and they're they're not treated as actors. They're treated as furniture. That was why Little House was so weird because we were treated like actors and spoken to like actual human beings and treated with respect, which was highly unusual. Um, so it is scary if someone just comes off Little House and then tries to go on a regular shoot where it's like, move the child over there, would you? <laughs> and you're like a table. It's just. <laughs> it's a whole other world so you went on to have what what they loosely refer to as a normal life i mean that's the thing is you went you went to you retired and went to kindergarten you went and did the normal things you went to school and got out of the cuckoo child star rat race which is probably a really good idea in retrospect yes we were totally normal kids so and we moved away from um southern california when I was like eight. So we had no contact with anyone. We, we didn't even really know anything about stardom. <laughs> they, I'm like, thank heavens. Um, <laughs> now, and then you had the word, thing. okay, so you're a, you're a twin. You have a twin sister and then you have a, another sister as well. So there's the three girls. There's actually four girls. Yeah. There's four of you. Wow. That's right. Well, and that's one of the reasons why I think my mom was done with the commercials is because she was pregnant with my little sister oh, no, when right? that was going on. And she just was like, how am I going to do all this? You know? <laughs> right. And am I supposed to, and what if, what if the other kids want to start acting? I'm going to, oh, yeah, that, nah. yeah, no, good call. Good call. <laughs> so, 
And one of the things you talk about in, in the book that is fascinating for someone who wants to, I, I can identify things. A lot of the things where, and it's what you talk about red tail feathers, it's a whole story about not being able to see the forest for the trees, not being able to see stuff that's in front of us because of that. And, and, and if you can explain the whole, like the little green thing and the red tail feather thingamajiggy, why it's called red tail feathers. Okay. Well, it's basically this moment where I discovered that I was kind of missing grace right in front of me. And I was sitting in this car with my husband. We were having kind of a not so great conversation. You know, those, those moments. And I saw this little green bird who was in this like tree and it was, he was hidden. And then all of a sudden he came out and he landed on my husband's side mirror of our car. And like a parrot like, or something like a freaking parakeet or little, tiny, tiny, tiny thing. little bird. Yes. And it was like, Oh, how did I miss that? And then all of a sudden it turned around and it had these just bright red tail feathers. Like it was like that moment where you thought, Oh my goodness, what else have I missed? You know, like my eyes have been opened and now I just am looking everywhere for what I missed. You know what I mean? So that was that moment. And that was like, a week after brain surgery. So your senses are very heightened after brain surgery, at least I, mine I were. <laughs> so that was kind of like my breaking point and where I started this, like, it felt like this journey of like, where else has grace been hiding? I guess that's so red tail feathers. That's where it comes from. And, and that's the thing we mentioned in the brain surgery. If people hadn't heard this before or seen the other show that, you are a survivor of brain surgery and not small brain surgery either, because I remember seeing when you pulled your hair back it's a couple of years back and showed us the like what looked like railroad tracks on your head. I mean, they really they they had to go in. I mean, there's there's people talking, oh, I'm having something done. They're going through my ear, my nose. They they just when it, you had a big old brain tumor. Oh, yeah. They sliced it and they peeled it back and they cut what my surgeon explained a pumpkin top in the head of the scalp and laid that over on the side table while they went through. And then when they were done, they put that pumpkin top back and they put some staples to, you know, sew my scalp back together. <laughs> they, they they popped your head open like a jack-o'-lantern. It's what they... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, on the surface, that's like completely terrifying, but you did this and it turned out it, it was benign. And, but you came out of this as a time once stories and you tell in the book, you woke up from this in this, this just like amazing space of you were so happy to wake up and be alive that you, you, you just were full of joy after waking up from, well, having your head cut open. It was bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like crazy to be, I mean, I'll spoil it, but I like literally just said, this is the best day of my life. And I just <laughs> yelled it in the hospital and everyone was like, what's wrong with her? <laughs> and my family was like laughing, but my husband was like, oh no, they've messed something up. <laughs> they <don't know. laughs> Maybe they crossed some wires. <laughs> I would put the stress of being told, oh my God, you have to have this terrible operation and what could go wrong. And then uh, to then wake up and go, oh, wow, wait, I lived and I'm okay. Yeah. You'd probably be pretty ecstatic after that, but that's a, a heck of a perspective to have on, on life to go through that. Yeah. Now the twin thing, it, it, I bring it up again, because one of the things that you talk about in here, you talk about so many things that anyone can identify with of the situations where we feel less than, we feel put out, we feel not seen. Um, the classic, like, you know, being picked last for a team or being on the team and let no really just sit over there. And many times you talk about feeling like this weird sense of competition with with your sister and like, oh no, she's is she better at this than me. But for an outsider, it's like, wait, dude, you're twins. I mean, to those of us who aren't a twin, we're like, aren't you like practically the same? Aren't you like, shockingly similar in that it's one thing for me to say, I'm going to go compete with this girl. I feel in competition with this girl because she's completely different than me. But for some of the two people who would be so incredibly alike to still even then go, ah, I just, I just know she's better than me. 
It's how does that happen? How does that happen where two people are so alike and born at the same time and yet can still feel that crushing sense of weirdness and competition? I think being a twin is just so strange. Um, People actually forget that there's two of you. And if that happens too often, which it does, (laughs) and you're always the one they forget that exists, which happened a lot. Um, It's just super strange. I don't know. I lived through a lot of that. And Brenda's just so determined and studious and successful that I very, very often felt just, I don't know, just invisible. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Well, and then those of us are not twins, they're really twins. They now have very different personalities. Back in the olden days, people would treat twins like they were the same person. They dressed them alike and all that stuff. But they now know twins, even even identical twins. Are you, you guys are identical. You're fraternal. Yeah. Or you are identical. We're identical. You're absolutely mm-hmm. identical. You're identical twins and you still were competing. It's, it's <laughs> so completely crazy. But even identical twins, there will be differences in the personality. And you absolutely can have one twin who is extremely extroverted and one who is more introverted. And they're they're very, very different, which is why it's very hard when people go, hey, let's dress them alike and pretend they're the same person, which is why getting on a TV show as a kid where we're literally going to pretend you are the same person. The same person, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, now your mother didn't do the dress alike thing. I mean, Med, certainly not after you were little tiny kids. We had some, we had some clothes that were the same, but no. And Brenda usually did not want to dress the same. <laughs> she wanted, she to get wanted out there her own different. identity. And I was kind of like, oh, but it's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of the follower. Was. So <laughs> yeah, you have talked about what the wear is, whereas the mother's like trying to do the right thing. Yes, you shall dress differently. And you were like, can I wear it? She's <laughs> <laughs> That you wanted to do the twin thing, which is kind of hilarious, but mm-hmm. it was, I can see where absolutely, I mean, twins are, it's a sense of belonging, but how do you do that? I mean, this is the ultimate, how do you distinguish yourself from your home life, others, people that you see the same as being an identical twin? How do you distinguish yourself? How do you do it? I didn't do it very well. <laughs> yes. I think I probably didn't really learn how to be like, super confident in my own skin until after my brain surgery, honestly, like for wow. you know, 38 years. And it probably was because I realized, wait a minute, I think I could be some, I could be good at something too. You know what I mean? And I just had to walk in that and not try to be like her. And, you know, we all sometimes do that as we want to like, be like whoever our role model is or whoever we feel is successful, you know? And for me, that was Brenda. And so I got to this point where I thought, you know what? I think I actually need to do, do this on my own, you know? And it's it's very productive. Obviously, in, in Hollywood show business, there's always some actress who is held up as like the it girl or the actress to be like, don't you want to be like, she's getting all the money. You should be like her. Yeah. And so that's absolutely ingrained in us in show business to try to compete and be like, be like somebody else, not be us, be like her. And it's very difficult. And, um, but yes, yeah, if I had somebody walking around to look exactly like me that way, I'd probably have a hell of a time. I'd drive me nuts. Um, but yeah, you find it. And I love you. I didn't do it very well. <laughs> I think you were good at things probably the whole time. You just didn't know. I I guess I didn't think so. You know what I mean? But I, anybody could say, you know, like, you're the, you're your most biggest critic, right? So... <laughs> But it's, it's fascinating. You do, you talk about these things that anyone can read. I mean, there's, there's some very sad things that happened to you, but I mean, literally even the, the, the basketball game and going, oh, I mean, I was horrible at sports. I wouldn't have even been on the team. They wouldn't have barely let me like, stand in the room where they were playing in case I jinxed it. Um, but the being picked last for thing, the not, that's just, yeah, everyone has had that. That is just crushing, even though it seems like a trivial thing to the adults for a kid that can be absolutely crushing. And you talk about those kind of feelings in this book and how, and then you talk about um, your stepdad and that whole incident. That's just, um, that was really, I was like, where is this story going? Oh, wow. We went there. Okay. Um, that he died and you were just like, yeah. You did nothing wrong, 
But we all say, I should have done this. I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have done this. I should have done, look, gone left, not right. How, how did you get, pull yourself out of that? Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> everything is like I'm, I'm actually terrible at things but that that's it if you it took you, a long you, time yeah it took a long hard. time you erase the fact that things are hard <laughs> yeah yeah I try not to like um you know sugarcoat it at all and really just tell the story of like where I was in that exact moment and how like super ooh, hard and yeah, grief is so hard. No matter what, it's hard. But especially when you have this like feelings of guilt or um, well, when you're you right there, something. when someone passes and you're like, should I have done something? What? The, uh, uh, how do you like as if you were supposed to somehow and you couldn't have fixed it? You later find out that medically there, there, there was nothing. There was nothing you could have done. Right. But you you absolutely tortured yourself for how long? It's just years and years and years years mm -hmm. yeah it was hard I and then it was like okay what am I doing I'm just yeah it was like this dark cloud every spring you know a month before his the anniversary of his death and it was like I can't do this anymore why am I doing this and you know lots of people have different experiences where um it's the same thing those times of year bring back those emotions no matter you know you know, whatever you've been through, there's sometimes those triggers that come up and that was me, you know, May when it would get kind of hot, all of a sudden it was just like, I was just in this dark cloud and I had to just get over it and just like literally say, I'm not carrying this anymore. <laughs> so God, you have to do this because I really can't do this anymore. Like I'm just, I'm crumbling here. So yeah, the surrender is a hard thing. And that's a thing, a theme in the book repeatedly. And you talk about grace and for our, our people don't know. Can you explain? I mean, yes, it is fabulously ironic. Yes, she played baby Grace. Yes, her name was Grace on the show and all her stuff is about crazy. Grace. But what is grace? What does grace mean to you? And you do have also in the back stories from other people on how what grace meant to them. But it, if you can't explain what grace means to you in these kind of stories and context. Yes. Yeah, so I try to define grace as basically like God working in your life. And that's always good because then we couldn't explain the bad things that happened. So really grace is every blessing, but it's also like every hard lesson learned, you know? And so this book is really every chapter is a different description, a different definition of grace um, you know, grace empowers, grace surrenders, grace, whatever, all the different things. Um, so it's really that it's, it's showing an example in someone's life of what grace looks like. And it's totally out of the box because grace has all different forms. And as you said, the, seeing the, you know, the birds, like seeing the forest for the trees that all the stories all seem to be about situations where we're so wound up in our own pain or angst. Or like I'm not good enough, and we've you know started to go down the rabbit hole of of that everything is bad, that we can't see that there is any good in our life or the world. We're sort you know shutting down, and that you come out of these and go, how do we not shut down when things are terrible and and something bad has happened? People die and terrible things happen, and the world is a hard place. When bad things happen, and you want to just shut down and withdraw. How do you not withdraw? How do you not shut down and still look for the light and the grace in the world? Right. Because there's always something good that's happening, no matter what. Now, hindsight is 2020 because in the moment, sometimes it's really, really hard to see grace. <laughs> but when you look back and you think, okay, what did I learn? What was the lesson here? What was I trying to, what it was that I need to overcome? You know, all these different things. Um, you know, what was that sliver of light? What was that sliver of goodness? Who was the person who showed up for me and sat with me or walked with me or whatever it is? It doesn't always have to be that it ended well. It's more, what is the good around the situation? Because there's always, there's always good. Well, that's like when they talk about look for the helpers when something terrible happens, a disaster, but look for the helpers that 
Yeah, the situation. It's not sugarcoating the situation like saying, well, this terrible thing happened, but it was really good that it happened. It's like, well, no, actually, no. it's still terrible that it happened. But was there someone who came and comforted you? Was there someone who you met because of the terrible situation? Exactly. I mean, having a brain tumor is not great, but... <laughs> It gave me just a different perspective. It opened my eyes to, a, I mean, my life changed so dramatically after the brain tumor. I just, everything was different in my life. And some of it was because I couldn't go back to my normal life. Thank right. goodness. But <laughs> so it just worked out amazing. You overcame it. And that's the thing is realizing, I mean, something so scary, but you survived it. And that would have had to, I mean, talk about giving you confidence. It's like, well, what can they do to you after that? <laughs> Right. Now, I'm also fascinated, you're fascinated with your, your whole writing process, because I know you went to, to workshops and everything. You have a blog and a video thing on your Facebook. You have what would, I guess, sort of like, in a derogatory way, be called a Christian mommy blog, except yours is good. And you actually, you because you can write. Um, you have things you write, you blog online. And so you're always writing. You're always writing something. You're always writing something for your fans, your followers. You have a whole thing on Facebook where people talk about grace and about God and their spiritual experiences. And then you, you're you live on there every time I turn around. You're on Facebook live talking. How do you generate all of this material? And is, is this just part of your process? Is It's amazing. Well, I will say is that I was keeping up on my blog before the first book. and honestly, there's a lot of content. And so I only blog a couple times a year on there. Um, really my focus went to vlogs, which are video blogs. And so that's what I really only concentrate on now is I do a weekly live video, um, with my normal page. And then I also do a weekly live video with my, like, as you would call my Christian mommy blog, which is really <laughs> a, <laughs> grace a a blog uh, i mean a a group just focused on grace and it's That's what know, big time grace or whatever it is yes it's called big time grace yeah so it's really just you know we read through the bible together we're doing all these things together but i just really do a vlog i guess that's what you want to call it that's a fancy word for a facebook live <laughs> no oh then i'm a vlogger too i have done yes that. you are you're a vlogger <laughs> Isn't that strange? How weird is it for, for you that, that the way things have changed? I mean, you're younger than I am, but you've seen so many changes where we used to just, you know, write articles and now it, everything is on the internet. Everything is via Facebook. Everything is via YouTube. Everything is video. How, how has this affected you and how weird do you find all of this? Well, I love the, I love the vlog thing. I love the, the live video. Um, now you can't, you can't edit a live video. <laughs> so <I> understand, sadly. <laughs> but I like that because it's just real and raw and it doesn't take as much work. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I think it's great. Um, I think people are more engaged with video than they are with written. So unless it's a, you know, a book that they're going to take home and read before they go to bed or whatever, I think, um, reading blogs online are becoming a little bit of a thing of the past. People just don't have the time and there's too many out there to keep up with it, but to watch a video while you're eating your breakfast or making your lunch or whatever in the car, people are watching it while they're driving in the car. I'm like, this isn't safe, but okay, whatever. <laughs> But it is, and they feel a connection because, like, I mean, I, I discovered that with my kooky readings and Little House books. And that started out of a thing I did it really to keep myself sane. It was in 2020, and like, you can't go anywhere because it's not safe. And uh, so I was sitting around and said, What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I have to do something. And then I had been reading this article and I'd gone to a workshop about acting where they talked about you need to read more you need to read people should read out loud more they said whatever you're doing public speaking acting 
hanging around the house, pick something up, magazine, cereal box, read out loud to the cats. It's good for your diction, for your brain, everything. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. And I thought, oh, I should go back and reread the Little House books. I've read them years ago and I'll read them in order. And now I can see like how the characters change and what Laura, and then I went, well, everybody else is bored out of their minds. I'll, th I'll go on. Th so you had taught me to do, we were at the Cherry Blossom Festival, and you were the one who taught me to do the first Facebook Live. I did not know how to do a Facebook Live, and we were like in the car, and you're like, I need to do it. I have to do my Facebook Live. Do you want to be like in the Sure. And you showed me how to do a Facebook Live, and you showed me all these things on your phone. You were so clever. I know. I'm so proud that I was the one to introduce you. It was so cool. <laughs> it was huge because I went, oh, I could do it. And then I wound up, of course, doing my stand-up show on stage at dot com and I became like queen of the internet. And I was like, I didn't know, I didn't know what a Zoom call was. I didn't know what stage it was when that all started. I suddenly learned all this stuff. But I did I knew how to do the Facebook Live because you always said, Well, you know, baby Grace showed me how to do this. It should be simple. And then I started reading those little house books and Man, did that catch on? I mean, people, re I wound up, I, it was over 600 readings and I got a plaque from Sacramento and it was like, ah. um, but it just started as, well, this will be helpful to me. And then this, maybe others are looking for connection and feel lonely and scared right now. And maybe, maybe this, and yeah, and it clicked and it was not something I expect. I did not sit down and say, well, this is going to be the thing. And I know I had friends who were like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go read a book online. And they, some of them did. And some of them lasted three days, but it was a thing. I didn't sit down and say, this is a giant marketing move here. I'm going to read these little house books online. And because of this, I will be on cameo and sell bonnets and suddenly have this huge press thing. Never. I not in a million years. I went, I'm going to go read this because I need to read this right now. <laughs> literally it and then we saw what happened so sometimes we do things and i think when they're real and organic as they like to throw around they work better than when we sit there and go well i have this is a good marketing move and i think that's maybe why your stuff works because it's it's real it's really coming from you yeah and i think there's some people that um maybe do a like they want to do like a paid monthly thing where you pay to be in a group. And it's like, mm -hmm, Very I, I don't know if that works so well. Um, I think that you have to just invest in your audience and show them you care and show them that you're just going to do it because you love them. You love what you're doing. You love your life and you actually love little house just as much as they do. <laughs> and, and then they realize like they do want to support you. And so instead of like asking them to do something, you're basically just investing in them and they want to do it anyway. And and that's what works for me because it's like, well, I said, here's my show on stage. And yes, you can you can purchase a ticket for that at a very low price. And I have things here you can, can purchase, but oh, here, no, y'all just pull up a chair. I'll read you the books here for the bonnet. I'll do that for free. Oh, yeah. my cooking show? Yeah, here we are. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> that was the nuttiest thing in the world. It was literally because I said, what do you people want? We've been reading these books. Now what? And the people started us on saying, we want cooking videos. Went, cook, you want cooking videos? Well, I do cook. And so I, I started literally with scrambled eggs. It was the first thing I ever made. And um, I couldn't, 5,000 people tuned in to watch me make scrambled eggs, which I thought was the just craziest thing in the world. But then that became a thing. But I, I didn't try. I was like, here, have some, yes, yeah, here, I'm going to make pie. Let's all watch. Because I do think there's lots of things I do for money. But then it was, this is just a thing we're going to do. And I think it wound up, yes, everything fed everything else. And it was fine. But I think that I think you have struck upon a thing and that's that's why that is working. I think that your Facebook stuff and all of this, I'm just here. This is the free part you get really works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it shows people that you're human and you care and it's not always about making money. And you connect and you connect with them. And that's one of the things you do in the book is like, um, just and. Okay, it got me. And I told you this when I first read, I did tell you, I said, just when I thought, oh, all right, I've gotten through this book without crying much. And I'm like, oh, well, this is very good. I've read it. That's nice. And then I get to the back, Stories of Grace. She's put this thing in the back of the book. If you get through the whole book without crying, then you have to read this part. Where people who you've met because of what you do share their stories. 
of the hardest times in their lives and how they got through it and how they discovered grace. And it's suddenly it's meet Susan, meet Sally, meet Sam. And you start in play. Okay. Now you got me. Okay. Something's in my eye. Yes. Um, yeah. Then I, I was, I was done. I was finished. I was like, just when I thought I'd gotten through the book, I was like, and now we're a mess. Um, that was incredible. How did you decide to do that? How did that come about the stories of grace from the other people? I was encouraging people to think of their own stories. And I thought, you know, how cool would that be to like have some of their stories? Because then it shows, okay, I did this, but other, like I'm baby grace. People like, oh, well, you're baby grace. You have a story. It's like, no, 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 no. Everyone has a story. So I thought, what if I invited them to submit a story and then I would pick a few. And so they're basically from the little house, you know, audience of fans. Um, there's a couple that aren't my sisters in there. And then a friend um, who had um, breast cancer. So I actually asked her if she wanted to write a story because I just thought it was great. And um, yeah, but they just submitted stories and I kind of like narrowed it down and had a couple people, um, my editor also, you know, say, oh, I think these ones would be good or these two are a little alike. So pick one, you know, or something, but. Because there must've been too many to pick from initially too. It must've been, you must've had quite a few. Yeah, there were a lot. There were, and they were all amazing. You know, how do you say one story is better than another, you know, but there could only, you know, there could only be so many in the book. So, yeah. <laughs> but that's, it's, that goes back to then the connecting with people directly like you do with your live stuff. Now you, you grew up in a family that went to church. We get, we get this question all the time. All of us on Little House, you know, this one where they say, Oh, because you are on Little House on the Prairie, do you all go to church now? Are you all Christian because of Little House on the Prairie? Many of them perhaps missing the fact that Michael Landon was Jewish and was practicing Jew and had a Jewish funeral and everything. Um, <laughs> or, or Ugi Orowitz. And, they assume that there's just because of the show. And of course, we you know, we had every faith in the world represented in that show. Catherine McGregor uh, went to the Vedanta ashram and visited India regularly, she did into Eastern religion. Um, but you, you just came by this naturally, as it were. Your family went to church. Your family were Christian. This wasn't some overlay like, well, I was on this TV show. So now magically, I am this. That's not how that happened. No, we just like literally had a family just like the Ingalls, which is so weird. <laughs> but yeah, no, we just, we did what the Ingalls family did. And that was just, I don't know, that's just how I grew up, you know? Um, I did every, you know, church choir and did the Christmas musicals and like everything. Um, went to youth group and went to church and went to Sunday night and served in the nursery. Like, you know, all those things that a good Christian girl does. <laughs> so it, this was a normal, a normal um, thing for me. Yeah. And I think that's because, as I said, it's, it's natural for you. This is something you're raised in. This is not something, this is, this wasn't some marketing scheme where you said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them I'm a Christian. That'll work. It, it's not, this is simply you. This is how you are. And, and you're unusual in that way because you're, you're very funny. You're very natural. And, and as I said, with the book, what I added, you go, I say, how did you do this? And you say, well, I wasn't very good at. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't come off with, well, now I am perfect. You should follow me because I am good at stuff. This does not <laughs> appear to be your message at all. I'm just as messed up as everybody else is. <laughs> but you you get through it with, as you said, you know, people say, oh, yeah, but you do it with grace. You, you literally do. So when you're having a difficult day with obviously with writing a book and all of the, the and what you're going to get with this book, you're going to get the usual things as I told, warned, I, I warned you when you wrote the first book, you're going to have all these people who are going to be fabulous and God, this is great. And then you're going to have people who are going to give you a hard time for the sake of giving you a hard time because there are, there are people who simply cannot be happy for somebody else. That's what just drives them crazy. And it just bothers them and they have to be annoying. Um, how do you, and you're basically, you are a very sensitive and vulnerable person. So I know that it does bug you when people are like awful to you. Um, how do you, what do you tell yourself? How do you get through these hard days? Well, I haven't had like a, an attack yet. So 
<laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> it's only been three days. So it's been three days. So <laughs> it's only been three days. Who knows? But um I think I just have to be I'm very sensitive. I take I do I get my feelings hurt really easily. Yeah. And I have to go, okay, like be confident in the message that you wrote. And there's never going to be, you know, there's always going to be somebody there's like you would say, the haters are going to hate. Haters going to hate. Haters going to hate. Gonna hate. So we don't so expect true. it to be perfect. And that's kind of like life. We don't expect life to be perfect. It's not always going to be the way we want it to be. And we just have to take one step in front of the other and keep going and keep believing that what we're doing matters. And for the people that are, you know, encouraged and inspired by it, that's who you wrote it for. You did not write it for the haters. <laughs> that, that's right. And and that's the thing is that focusing on, on, on your message that, although as you said, yeah, we, we do, we're, we grew up in Hollywood. They, they take things, everything personally. It's terrible, but it's, when you're focused, I think, on the message, on, on the mission, on the, you know, on topic, as it were, and you're on track with, this is what I want people to know. This is the, what I want to help people, give people this message, give them strength and hope. And if you're focused on the message, then it's less about what somebody says about you. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So now what is your advice to young writers out there now that you, because you've you wrote a second book. I haven't written a second book. I'm terrible. So you, what What's is your the cooking one? Isn't it coming? I know I'm working on the cooking one. I'm working okay. on the cooking. I have all the, I have like the chapters laid out and everything. Breakfast, not breakfast. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you, what do you, what do you tell writers? Cause I remember we talked so much when we first started this about writing and, and like I said, you taught me how to do Facebook live. I told you about writing a book. Um, what would you tell someone like you who says, I think I want to write a book. I think I want to get my story or my beliefs out there. I think that first you need to find another writer to team up with because you can't do it by yourself and you need some peer editing. That's what I would suggest. And then once you have that, you need to hire an editor. Please don't publish a book unless you hire an editor. And if you get a great big publisher with an editor and they say, here is your editor, terrific. And if they say, we don't have an editor, you go, can you have one? You have a phone number or somebody I could call and hire them because we're going to have an editor. Yes. You need yes. an editor. Yeah. The greatest writers, there's all sorts of fabulous writers out there. You go, wow, this person's so brilliant. They, they all have editors. They all have editors they're working with. And it does work. And it, it's part of the process. You know, it's funny. You think of writing as this loner solitary process. And I'm sure I actually had some fantasy of that when I started writing my book. It's a team thing. It's the, the, the literary agent and the editor and all of these people involved. And then the people who you know and are trust and say, hey, check out this chapter. It's absolutely a team thing. And then of course, if you actually have a book where you have a publisher and it's coming out, everybody from the art director to the publicity department and legal, you're just like, it's a whole room full of people. But writing it's it's a group thing you're talking to thousands of other people with this book hopefully thousands or more with others of this book and you are working with an editor and with an agent with this and it's it's not solitary at all it's it's very very weird um what would you say was like the best thing your editor i don't know how many editors you've gone through at this point what would you say the best thing an editor has told you oh boy um Well, the editor that I hired is someone that I wanted to work with, and he was an editor for a book that I read mm. right after my brain surgery, and oh, it was a book that kind of changed me, and it was a um, a devotional, and so, but he is a memoir specialist, and so that's why I wanted to go with him, and- someone who really knew their stuff exactly see but look at how your brain works look at how your brain works this person was the editor on a devotional but is a memoir specialist and it's a book i read that actually helped me so i'm gonna i'm gonna go get that editor okay mm -hmm. you know most people aren't that smart that's very very smart that's 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 what you do you go okay I'm seeking out people, but I'm seeking out people from books that help me. I'm seeking out, this is someone very specific to the task. That's very, very clever and probably why your book is good, but there you are. So how did you manage to get this person to be your editor? I 
just contacted him. But but the coolest thing was is that I turned the book into him and he said, I'm going to read the first couple chapters and then let's have a phone call to make sure we're a good fit, which I think is a great idea. A really oh, great that's idea. That's the only way to do it. Yep, 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 yep. Yes. And then <laughs> this is crazy, but he said, Wendy, I love it, but I don't think this is the book that you want to write. Ooh, and I said, yeah. and he said, half of this, I want you to throw away. Ooh. And the other half, I want you to keep, and I want you to make it even more story-driven. So it was the best thing because I said, good, because that's what I want to write. Like, I want to write a book that feels like you step into a movie a little bit, like right in the middle of it, and not something that's telling you what to think or what to believe or this like kind of teachy preachy thing. Like, I was like, I don't want that. I want someone to just experience what I experienced and decide for themselves. And so he's basically, he was the one and I basically had to like, kind of start over. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing with that is that every time you go through and edit, every time you have somebody read it who has comments, it just gets better and better and better. And sometimes they want to slay your children, you know, your favorite parts of something. And you have to like step outside yourself and know that some things need to be cut that maybe you don't want to cut. <laughs> and, and then they like the darndest things. Cause I know where I wrote my book. It's like, okay, I knew I said, mm, and I talked to like the agent who was really holding my hand through it. Cause he only said, okay, you know, pick a couple things, as I say, you know, hill to die on, pick a couple of things that you're like, no, we're going to fight for that. And then everything else you can kind of like go, okay, you can cut that, but I, I need to keep this. <laughs> so we'll just pick a couple things. You're like, yeah, we really, really need to keep that that you're going to say, and we'll go with that while well, I'll fight to the death for these things. But everything else, you know, has got to be you know, rewrites in them. Okay. And I remember I wrote this whole thing about what happened to me in Florida. I was making a movie with this thing with this possum that was found. And I thought, well, they're never going to keep this. I'm just going gonna, gonna to write this anyway because it was interesting at the time. I don't know. They're going to say, what is this nonsense? You've written all these pages about a, a bloody freaking possum. And they're going to say I'm crazy. And they're going to cut that. And I can say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cut the possum like I'm giving them something. <laughs> Do you know what happened? They called back and said, we really, really like the possum story. Could you expand upon that? Could you make it longer? <laughs> I, I did. I had, to, I had to write more. More detail, more detail about oh. awesome. And I was like, but the, and you know what? It is a really good story. And it, it was because it was a whole crazy thing of like, as my mother says at one point, why do these things always happen to you? And so it, it was one of those things, but you don't know, you don't know. Cause you were there and have you that to the outsider and to the people who knew what they were doing with books they went no see this story you didn't think was important actually is important and this story that you thought was terribly important actually you know, we're not, it's not that important and you don't know until you pull in the other people that's like when i wrote wrote the story about the maggots <laughs> i totally thought that they were going to cut that one <laughs> and, and she was what? like i love this story it kind of is like funny and lighthearted and like we're talking about maggots in a package in your college mailbox. Like, <laughs> you're like, ew. And they're like, no, like, this is great. Okay, I guess we're keeping that one. <laughs> yeah, you don't know because it's, you're too close. It's, it's, it's like the feathers. It's like the not being too forest for the trees that you you can't see it because you're too close. And and that that's absolutely the whole message of the book is you can't see what is really happening and how this is going to pan out when you're in the middle of it. And you write these stories where you're in the middle of it. You're in the middle of the pain or the sadness. And you can't see how, how am I get how would I possibly get out of this? And then, and then you do. <laughs> yep. So have, where do we get it? Where do we get the book? Now it's at three whole days, three whole days. Where do we buy it? Yes, you can get it wherever books are sold. Um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, whatever little bookstore, you can even, you know, go and say, hey, can you order this? And they'll order it. Um, I also do sign copies on my Etsy shop. So if you want a signed copy, you can get one straight from me. Uh, but really, you can get it wherever you want. 
Yeah. And don't go into a bunch of crazy, uh, wacky little house reunion, goofy things way out in the middle of nowhere. We're going to be in Kentucky and, uh, and then we're in Oklahoma. Yes. I, mm-hmm. I have to keep track in Nashville. There's a boat right now and you're going to a bunch of these. And of course you will have tons of your, all, any personal appearance that she is at. You will have tons of books. Yes. And you are amazingly also, you're going to be speaking at, at church. That's the other thing that you do. You will do a personal appearance and there'll be, you know, autograph signing and talking. But you then go to the local church on the Sunday as well. Sometimes I get to. And even sometimes Allison joins me. <laughs> That's what you're, And that one no one expects. So like, surprise. Uh, <laughs> what was it the last time we were in church and you said, look, lightning didn't strike the building. <laughs> All right. Yep. Well, this is going to be a hoot and we are going to be together very soon in Kentucky. The first one I'm off to a thing yes. then we'll be there. And um, I, yeah, I think this is, I think the people who read the, the devotional are going to read this. And then I think a whole group of people who didn't buy the devotional are going to buy this one. So I think it's going to be yet. A, I think we're going to have yet another hit. I'm so pleased. I'm always pleased when any of the people I grew up with on the show do well, but it's really fun to see our, our youngest, our youngest members, um, turn out and do so well and i know how hard your work and i just love your whole process of how you came to these things it's just fascinating so thank you everyone this is yes wendy luli of red tail feathers and you can go get that online and this is the allison arngram show and i'm allison arngram i found my way